Hi, I'm Brett Johnson, former United States Most Wanted cyber criminal, now good guy, and host of The Brett Johnson Show. Today's episode, episode number 77, is an Anglerfish podcast flashback, part 13, a rogues gallery from the original internet godfather, that being me, to the largest credit card thief in history, to the Quadriga Cryptocurrency Exchange, and a missing $235 million plus shadow crew was a rogues gallery of the top cyber criminals on the planet. This episode examines some of their stories. Without further ado, enjoy. Turns out, once you stop breaking the law, law enforcement turns out to be pretty good people. Okay, okay, they're pretty good people all the time, but when you're a crook, law enforcement is the opposition. It's the Cowboys versus the Steelers, and I'll let you figure out which side has Roger Staubach and which one has Terry Bradshaw. When you're a criminal, there is no good cop. We don't like law enforcement, and we take that shit serious. What's kind of interesting now that I'm a good guy is that law enforcement doesn't harbor the same types of feelings. To law enforcement, it's a job, and they don't hate the people they arrest. They tend to feel sorry for the guys they are arresting. Sure, some cops are angry, but the anger tends to stem from seeing the guys they arrest not changing their ways, not applying themselves for the good instead of the bad. It took me 40-some years to realize that. 40-some years to understand that working for the better of society is far more rewarding than being a criminal. My associates, my criminal buddies over the years, some of their stories on this episode of Anglerfish. Welcome to the Anglerfish Podcast, where we visit the darkest corners of our online lives. I'm your host, Brett Johnson. The United States Secret Service called me the original Internet Godfather. Now, what does it take to get a title like that? 39 felonies, a place on the United States Most Wanted list, an escape from prison, and I built the first organized cybercrime community, Shadow Crew. Shadow Crew was a precursor to today's darknet and darknet markets, and it laid the foundation for the way modern cybercrime channels still operate today. This first season of the Anglerfish podcast tells of my rise and fall as the world's first internet godfather. It's a fascinating story. You'll learn how cybercriminals think, how modern cybercrime came into being, and why it's so successful and hard to stop, and how I was able to turn from a life of crime to one of using the knowledge I acquired as a criminal to help protect others against the type of person I used to be. Do you still stay in touch with any of these associates, as you call them? <laughs> well, they're not friends, right? They're associates. Right. Um, do I stay in touch? That's kind of an interesting question. Some of them stay in touch with me. Um, so Kevlar was one of our ID makers. He made a Michigan ID, which would pass in the state of Michigan, which was really doing it mm -hmm. back then. Back then you had to, you'd print on Teslin or you didn't have a real multi-spec hologram or anything else like that. But he made a Michigan ID that would actually pass in the state of Michigan. Now he ends up being arrested, of course. He, he ended up contacting me probably two months ago and told me he had been watching me and was proud of everything that I was doing. And he said that he was now married and had a good family and a good life and everything else. And he was still kind of reminiscent of the old days. But <laughs> When you say reminiscent of the old days, uh, did he long for the income? No, I don't know if he longed for the income. The way he said it, and he's right when he said it, he said, you know, Brett, we changed the world. And we did. Sure we did, did it for the negative not the positive. but it, it depends on how you look at that. Well. <laughs> no, no I, I, in, in the sense that uh, you brought out some issues that had to be dealt with at some point. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, and that's, that's the weird thing. is I, I really do believe, at least as far as cybercrime goes, 
that someone would have done it. I just happened to be at the forefront of that. I, if it hadn't been me, someone else would have stepped in my place and, and, and committed the same types of crime or refined cybercrime or instituted that type of platform that we have today. But Kevlar, he contacted me. He had been arrested uh, back when Shadow Crew got popped. He had been arrested, and he had flipped. He would worked for the FBI, and he didn't have any charges. That was the big thing with him. They, he actually was able to work off the charges, and he was never charged with anything, so he doesn't have a criminal record. But uh, he was he was a little reminiscent, but he was also adamant about not going back to what he had done in the past. How and old is this fellow? Mid thirties. Ah, oh. yeah, mid thirties. So you know, a kid when he was doing it. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. But you you know you talk about people who have contacted me, uh, David Thomas. That that was the guy who went by the screen name of El Mariachi. He contacted and he was irate. Uh, David Thomas was our resident conspiracy theorist. Oh uh, yeah, you know I jet fuel me- melts steel beams. That guy. Yeah. But uh, he's now in hiding in Mexico, as the word where he is now. Um, whether he's committing crime or not, I would assume that he probably is, simply because. Well, and here's the weird thing about David. David had no real skill online. He was a grifter. He was a con man in the real world. Once he got online, you know, he, he talked himself, and when he was arrested in Issaquah, Washington, I've already told that story about El, El Mariachi, my second in charge. Once he was arrested, he actually talks the, the FBI and to give him a job. Uh, my understanding, other than the website, the grifters, is that his, his work was not very good uh, as far as what he delivered. Uh, right, uh, I after remember he, that. Yeah, after he gets yeah. out of... Uh, after the government cuts him loose, he works for a couple of security companies. I've actually talked to the people who he worked under, and there were a couple instances where they let him go because he was just screwing around. So that, that tends to be, honestly, Ken, that tends to be the story of it. The thing is, is that a criminal, especially a cyber criminal, they will not change their ways, myself included. They will not change their ways unless there is some drastic something that happens that makes them change they're not just it's not prison it's not prison that does that it's like the (laughs) it's like the wife beater that suddenly gets caught and finds the lord yeah they find the lord as long as somebody's watching yeah right and and again my you know you know my story my story is no different than that right when when i was when i was released from prison i went back to crime I ended up violating probation. Not only do I violate probation, but when I get out from probation, what do I do? I go back to crime. And I, yeah, it was, I was scared to death to commit crime, but I was still screwing around with stuff. And then, then when I get, you know, when, when it becomes evident that, well, not even evident, when I start getting some speaking gigs and some consulting gigs and everything else, at that point is when this whole transition comes along. But it was not only that, it was the, the changes for me were my sister, my wife, Michelle, the FBI, it was the, the realization that I was, I was being given an opportunity to not break the law anymore. That was, that was a huge bit of it. Uh, you know, with me, Microsoft came, came in and hired, and it was, it was literally, I kid a lot on stage about an aha moment, but that was an aha moment. I remember when you got your first check from Yeah, I went and bought mattresses for the family. Bought mattresses. That, uh, <laughs> hey, around the mattresses for the whole family. Yeah, it's yeah. like we need new mattresses. Let's buy mattresses. <laughs> but and and I was it was it was I don't remember if it was before or after that, but I was at home and uh I was everybody else was asleep and I was sitting there and it, it hit me, man. It, I was like, I'm not gonna break the law anymore. It was that literal aha moment at that point. And since then, I've been fine. Now, up until that point, right. I was still prepping. I wasn't necessarily breaking the law, but by God, I was preparing to in right. case everything else went south. Yeah, you know. But uh, these other guys, uh, unless something makes them change, they're not going to take take this guy Omar Dahani. This cat. Now he is in the news today. Well, not today, but recently. All right. So there was a uh, you know cryptocurrency right. like Bitcoin, everything else. This kid, when he was with Shadow Crew, he was a money launderer. And what he laundered was e-gold. So if you look at cryptocurrency today, Bitcoin, uh, Monero, things like that, the precursors to Bitcoin and Monero for criminals were things called e-gold and Liberty Reserve. They were basically cryptocurrency without the blockchain. 
All right, so ego, what it was, and it was funded the exact same way that you fund your Bitcoin accounts today and everything else. But back then, if you wanted to launder money or you wanted to pay another criminal, the way you had to do that is you would go and get prepaid debit cards, you'd record the stripe on the back, you'd email the stripe to somebody, and you'd, you'd fund it on your end. They'd take the stripe, that's that, the data that you'd sent, they'd encode it on a card, and then cash out an ATM. Or you do Western Union. Well, finally, you got to where you could use Ego, which you would transfer these these fake gold tokens back and forth to people that were worth money that you could exchange for money at some banks and people who bought and sold, just like cryptocurrency. Um, the Ego site or that that platform gets shut down for money laundering, and then Liberty Reserve pops up, did the exact same thing. It gets shut down for money laundering, and then Bitcoin pops up. Which, if people wonder why Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder of Bitcoin, is anonymous, well, one of the reasons why is they go and get his ass in charge for money laundering. Because, but make no mistake, Bitcoin is a, is a token that is used for money laundering. It's used for human trafficking, drug trafficking, financial cybercrime, to hide ma massive amounts of assets, everything else. So it's a, it's a huge facilitator of money laundering. Uh, now, what Omar did back in the days with Shadow Crew is he used eGold and he helped people set up accounts and launder their money out like that. He also provided debit cards that allowed people to launder money out. He had some bank accounts he would transfer funds in and out of, everything like that. So he was, he was fairly well-versed on how to launder funds. Now, this kid, of course, gets arrested. He gets convicted. He serves time. All right, now he gets out. When he gets out, he changes his name to a name. His new name is Michael Patron. So Omar changes his name to Michael Patron. Now here's the thing: you got to remember that Omar is a money launderer. Not only is he a money launderer, but he was a member of Shadow Crew, so he knows how to do all this other shit too: fake identities, new identities, credit card theft, everything else. Now I say that. Because Michael Patron, a.k.a. Omar Dahani, he's a co-founder of a little cryptocurrency exchange called Quadriga. Hmm. Now, what's interesting about Quadriga, this is about a year ago, the CEO of Quadriga goes to India and he dies. Not only does he die... But $235 million worth of cryptocurrency disappears with him. Now, Michael Patron, Omar Dahani, is a co-founder of Quadriga. What's kind of interesting is this is CEO of Quadriga. He dies in a part of India that's known for faking deaths and ah. counterfeit birth certificates. Or not birth certificates, but death certificates. All right, $235 million worth of crypto missing all of a sudden. So the question is, is wonder if anything happened. What's kind of interesting is, is that turns out there were a couple of DNA, a couple of domains registered to make it look like they were coming from official government India sites that may or may not have been involved in, the, in what may or may not be a cover-up of the CEO's death, or su supposed death, or whatever you want to call it. Now, I'm not saying any of this stuff. All right, it's Anyone that wants to can look this shit up on Reddit as much as they want to. I, Lord knows I've went down that rabbit hole as well. Did the guy fake his death? Don't know. The only thing I know for sure is that $235 million is missing and that one of my associates was involved in setting up this website. Now, he step, supposedly stepped away long before the CEO dies. But still, he was involved in this shit. And not only that, but he knows how to do this stuff as well as I know how to do this stuff. Right. So that's one of my associates. But there's a whole list of these people. So we've already talked about David. We've talked about Albert Gonzalez. Well, you asked me how he had been arrested. The only thing I would add about Albert is that Albert was Albert was a people person. 
As far as Albert being that specter of a hacker, and he's on a couple of these lists of the most dangerous hackers on the planet and everything. As far as him being a technically skilled hacker, he's no more skilled than me or most any of anybody else that was on the site. And I am not horribly skilled. I'm a people person too. I know who to ask to do things. I know who to put in charge. He, Albert was the exact same way. So if you look at, Albert was involved with the TJ Maxx hack. He was involved with uh, Dave and & Buster's and Heartland Payment Systems. TJ Maxx, who did that? A guy named Maxim Yastrzemski. Maxim or Maxik was his name online. He's a Turkish national. He's the guy that actually hacked into TJ Maxx and stole all that data. So they arrested him in Turkey, at the airport in Turkey, got his laptop. On his laptop, he had TrueCrypt. The entire thing was encrypted. They looked at him and said, you know, we need the key to unlock all that encrypted data. And he was like, you know, I'm not giving you the key to unlock all that encrypted data. So then they were like, you know what? We've got a place for you. They throw, throw him in a Turkish jail for 11 days. Guess what? He promptly gives them the key to unlock the data. And guess what? They promptly give that guy 30 years in a Turkish prison, prison all of a sudden. Jeez, now, we... have you seen Midnight Express? I have. I'm I not have. even sure the dude's still alive anymore. So that was him. But that's that's what Albert did with the Heartland Payment Systems. There was this kid named Jonathan James. Now, I don't use, when I talk to, to companies or I give a presentation or anything like that, I don't use the word hacker because we're not hackers. We're criminals. Okay, let, let's pause right here and let sure. me ask you, what is your definition of a hacker? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> now that's good right there. So what is the definition of a hacker? You have to go back. So the word hack actually starts popping up in the English language around the year 1200. All right. And what it meant at that point was taking an object, a sharp object, and cutting through something in, an, in a, 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 a means that was not ordinary, something out of the norm. Okay. Now, when it starts being applied to tech was in the 1950s, around 1955, when MIT started to apply that word saying that people were, if you were going to hack into an electrical system, to please make sure you had the breaker box turned off so you didn't get shocked to death. And as it continued from there, it became this, it, it kind of intertwined with that 1200 definition with a more modern tech of someone using um, unconventional means to access a computer system, not criminal means. Right. It was not crim the, the, the use of, of criminality in hacking doesn't appear until the year 1963, All right. at which point you get this whole black hat type mentality of that. Now, so what we've got now, and the reason I, I, I look all this stuff up, because I like to know what words mean. Words have meaning. All right. right. The problem now is that the media, but not only the media, but a lot of these security companies that make a lot of money from cybersecurity and cybercrime, they like to call any online crime a hack. <laughs> and anyone who commits an online crime is a hacker. But that's certainly not true. All right, now Jonathan James is kid, and he was a kid. As a minor, and if there's ever been a hacker, that specter of the, you know, the, and you see all the pictures, the guys in the hoodies and bent over the keyboards in the shadows and all, that's not what anyone looks like at all, no. <laughs> I mean, and, and highly skilled attackers, there are those out there that are able to break in, in, into any computer system they want to, but their numbers are very small, very small. The 98, 99% of cyber criminals, they're just good social engineers. They know what it takes to manipulate someone into giving up one of four things, information, access, data, cash. That's it. Yeah. You know, the other one or 2%, yeah, they're highly skilled attackers, and if they decide to target your system, you're done. You're done. They're nation state people. They're, they're people who are selling uh, crime as a service, that type of thing. All right. But the other 98, 99%, no, they're social engineers. They're using off the shelf products. They're going by tutorials. They're networking with other people in order to commit crimes, stuff like that. Jonathan James, Jonathan James was a highly skilled attacker. There is no doubt about that. As a minor, as a minor, the kid broke into the DOD, into Pentagon. He broke into the NASA computer system and caused it to be shut down for six weeks. NASA shut their systems down for six weeks because of the damage the kid did. Who is the fellow that you I've heard you speak of that had uh, the 
he hacked into an airplane and a, a ship. That was Chris Roberts. Chris Roberts is, is he's a law-abiding citizen. He is a hacker, and he is not a criminal. So that's that's one of these these cases. Is is Chris is certainly a hacker. He goes out and he 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 exposes these security gaps, these these things that people aren't doing properly, in an effort to bring attention to it. So when he hacks into the United Plane, it's not because he's trying to break the law. It's simply because United and all these other airlines didn't listen. He's sitting there bitching for months and years. Hey, you guys need to really watch out about your security on here because the only thing a plane is is a flying database. Yep. Are you not paying attention? Well, let me get you to pay attention. So that's what he does. Uh, when we were in Turkey, he was actually scanning some of the ships that were going by. And guess what? They had horrible security as well. He's doing the same thing with, with uh, trains these days, showing these, these fallacies, these problems. You've got wide open systems that can easily, if a, if a malicious attacker decided to access that and do something, they could. And guess what? You guys aren't doing anything about it. So let me show you what can be done. That's that's Chris Roberts. He's a great guy. Great guy. Now, the opposition, Jonathan James, not a great kid. All right. And truthfully, as as a kid, if someone would have gave the guy some mentorship, some sort of guidance, taking him in under the wing, he may have been all right. But what happens is, is once he gets out of the trouble with the Pentagon, NASA, all this other bullshit, he decides he's going to go into credit card theft. He partners with Albert Gonzalez because Albert is not. Albert is not a highly skilled attacker. He's a people person. Right. He's management. Like me. I'm management. <laughs> All right. There are three things to cybercrime, three necessities. Gathering the data, committing the crime, cashing out. That gathering the data stuff is where I put this, this upper tier hacking that most of these media groups and security companies talk about. All right. I can do that, but I'm not great on it. Where I am great is figuring out what to do with the information, committing that crime, and then laundering the money out. I am outstanding in both of those fields. Albert's outstanding in both of those fields as well. All right, But as far as hacking, no. Jonathan James, oh yeah. So he partners with Albert. Albert, or Albert's blamed for the Heartland payment system breach. All right, so But when Albert was arrested... Maxic or Maxime over in Turkey was arrested. Jonathan James was arrested. Two or three other people were, were arrested as well. Now, Jonathan James thought they were going to put the blame of Heartland Payment Systems and Dave and & Buster's at his doorstep. Truthfully, looking back, probably true. He was probably the guy who got that data. All right? So what does Jonathan James do? He gets up one day, walks in his dad's bedroom, gets out the forty-five walks in the bathroom, writes a note, steps in the shower, blows his brains out. That's what happens to Jonathan James. Now, Albert, Albert, meanwhile, Secret Service guy, big black eye, because he's an informant of the Secret Service, they paid the kid $75,000 a year to work for them. Not only that, but they befriended him. Not only befriended him, but gave him notes, memos, that they weren't supposed to be giving him. So he was able to, and the no, here's the bad thing about it, the memos the Secret Service were giving him, they were the memos talking about Heartland Payment Systems, TJ Maxx, Dave & Buster's, so he knew what the hell they were looking at. Meanwhile, he's the guy that's orchestrating the entire crime. So he knew what, what to stay away from. But that's, that was Albert. He gets two 20-year prison sentences. We had all these guys. Max Butler. Jesus Christ, Max Butler. So Max is in the book Kingpin by Kevin Polson. All right? right. I'm in that book as well. The book's title is called Kingpin, How One Hacker Took Over the Billion Dollar Underground Cybercrime Industry Market, whatever the hell you want to call it. So I was in that book as well. Max is the principal in it. Kevin Polson writes the book. Max is the, I guess you could call the protagonist as far as there's going to be a protagonist in that book. I am the antagonist. I'm the bad guy. <laughs> Right, and Correct. Kevin is is has is adamant through that book of trying to paint Max as you know he's really not a bad guy. He's really not. He's you know he's just misguided. He was just so misguided. That's basically the crux of the book. All right. So he was the catalyst. Oh yeah, yeah. It's don't blame Max. Max is going to be fine. And it it, it closes the book. 
you know, the Max, the, when the Max story closes, it's talking about how Max is doing all this stuff for the government. You know, he's, he's trying to assist the government and everything else. All right, so the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter actually comes out about two months ago. Max was set to be released in 2025. Max gets indicted two, two and a half months ago while serving time in prison. What does he do? Well, what he does is he buys a cell phone in prison. They're not allowed in prison, you know. If you get a cell phone, where do you get it? You buy it from a guard. The guards sell these things for $800 to $1,000 a piece. That $40 prepaid cell phone, that smart, that cheap smartphone at Walmart that's $40, guards go down and they buy that. They resell them to inmates for $800 to $1,000. And where does the average inmate get $800 to $1,000? From his family. Uh-huh. From his family. So Max pays $800 to $1,000 for his cell phone. He uses his cell phone to get on the dark web. Gets on the dark web, gets stolen credit card details. Uses the stolen credit card details to fund his buddy's commissary accounts in prison. Uses one of the, one of the credit cards to buy a drone. Uses the drone to have other cell phones, drugs, and what have you delivered inside of the prison. Now, needless to say, he gets caught at that. Mm, and the, he's killing the guards' business. Absolutely. Yeah. So he gets, he gets arrested, gets indicted. His new release date is no longer 2025. I'm guessing 2035, 2040, something like that. This is this kid. This kid who stole 60 million credit card numbers. He gets, and it, that wasn't his first crime. He starts back when he was a, a minor as well. He breaks into Valve because he wants to play Half-Life 2. He steals the code to Half-Life 2, serves time over that. That wasn't even the kid's first charge. If you read the book Kingpin, Polson writes it of, oh, he was a security researcher. He was trying to warn the federal government and all these websites that they were vulnerable. They wouldn't listen, so what he did was is he just went ahead and broke into them. What's your opinion of Polson? You know... I think Polson's all right. Okay. I think Polson's all right. Now, Polson, for people who don't know, Kevin Polson was a was a cyber criminal as well. I'm not going to call him a hacker either. Kevin Polson was a cyber criminal, just the same as I was. He was arrested for uh, <laughs> for manipulating radio show contests. Ah. So he would call in. He would have it rigged where he was the only person able to call in, and he won himself a Porsche doing that. All right. <laughs> Once he gets out of that trouble, he goes on to be the editor of Wired magazine. I, I don't know where he is now, but I don't have a problem with Kevin Polson. My problem, my my huge problem with him was that he he bet on the wrong horse. You know, Max Butler gets indicted. Brett Johnson, the antagonist of Kingpin, goes on to be well. I it looks like I'm the good guy these days. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Certainly not Kevin Polson. But that was Max. But Max had that had that streak in him. When I knew Max, when he was on uh, Shadow Crew under um, under the screen name of Iceman, this guy, if you pissed him off, my God, what he would do is he would find out what your email address was. He would send child porn to your email, and then he would report you to the, the authorities right then, trying to get you arrested. He would threaten to kill people. I mean, this was this guy. He was never a good person. Never. And I'm not saying I was. I certainly was not. But I didn't do bullshit like that either. But uh, for someone to try to, and that was a bit, that's one of the things I have a problem with. If you're going to write a book about a criminal, by God, make them a criminal. Don't try to paint them as a good guy or anything else or a misguided soul. Right. They're not. I was not misguided. I chose to break the law. And when you're trying to write it, oh, you know, he just he, he he was trying to do the right thing. No, no, by God, he was not trying to do the right thing. <laughs> he was never trying to do the right thing, and he's he's not been trying to do the right thing, as you can tell by his indictment two months ago. And of course, the Kevin Polson quarter is quiet about that one. Yeah. So that's that was Max Butler. But I mean, all these guys were like that, man. Um, Roman Vega, he was Boa. I've already told you he was arrested in Cyprus. Script. Oh my God, that was a big thing. You know, Script started Carter Planet. It goes south for us. Script shuts down Carter Planet. 
is what he does. Now, now, what actually happens here, when we partnered with the Ukrainians and the Russians, we were open across the board, or at least I thought we were. From, from the American, the English-speaking side, we were open. If something happened on our website to a member, we announced that. We said, this is what's happened. We've taken these steps to try to protect every single member. You know, if it was a if it was a top tier guy that was arrested, if it was a low tier guy that was arrested, we still said this is what's happened. You guys who have dealt with this person need to be aware of it. We've banned them. We've removed all the posts, everything else. We've tried to scrub everything that's mentioned about this guy. The Ukrainians didn't do that. So when Bo Boa was arrested, you know, they didn't announce that stuff. Script knew things were going south for his people, but he didn't share that information. He kept it within himself. So. That was one of the big problems is we didn't know as English speakers just how bad things were getting for the Ukrainians. So the thing is, is Script knows that things are going south for Carter Planet as well, but he's not telling anybody about it. So Bo has been picked up. Big Buyer's been picked up. All these people have been picked up since. And then October 26th, the Secret Service arrests 33 people Six hours, six countries. All right? Wow. Now, here's the interesting thing. 33 people were arrested, but only 29 were mentioned. All right? The other four, no one knows about. The other four, who are they? And I, I could tell you, and I, I'd have to look at the records and everything else. Not really important. Some of them were Ukrainians. What was kind of important, though, is that script doesn't mention any of his people trying to be picked up or anything like that. One of the guys runs his ass down to Argentina. He's not arrested for another seven years. The only real person that was mentioned of not being arrested, one Gollum fun, me, Brett Johnson, all right? Script, though, he doesn't mention, again, any of his guys as being in trouble. One of his guys named Tron. So not only the guy who runs down to Argentina, but this other really sophisticated hacker, if you want to call him that, named Tron. Tron had access to Bank of America. What kind of access? The type of access that Bank of America could not shut down. As a matter of fact, when I started working for the Secret Service, Secret Service, they bring in the Bank of America officials to ask me what the hell I know about Tron, which not much, to be honest with you. I knew that Tron had great data. He could get into any system he wanted to, sell you whatever the hell you wanted to at that point. So what was happening was is that Bank of America would find out how Tron had accessed the system. They would close that hole. Within 24 hours, Tron would be back in with another hole. All right. So they were wanting to know what the hell. They had identified Tron. They were going to pick him up on October 26, 2004. Secret Service is literally in the air to go and arrest his ass in the Ukraine. They're in the air. They call the Ukrainian police. By the way, we're coming to pick this kid up. Will you be waiting for us? Ukrainian police are like, oh, yeah, come on down and get him. We'll make sure we we'll be right there for you. The Ukrainian, Ukrainian police, once they hang up with the Secret Service, they get in the car, go down and tell Tron. Oh, by the way, looks like the Secret Service are in the air coming to get you right now. Tron escapes. Because that's the way the Ukrainians and the Russians do business. Which brings us to Script. Script shuts down Carter Planet. Script is arrested as I'm beginning work for the Secret Service. So I was arrested in February 8th of 2005. Script is arrested around May of 2005. He spends six weeks in a Ukrainian jail. How he was arrested? He tries to buy. He's over in the Ukraine. He gets a buddy in the United States to go and buy two Nissan Muranos and one of those Nissan QX45s, whatever the hell that, that, the Infinity thing, the big boat SUV thing that they sell. Right. He buys these things, and he wants them shipped over to the Ukraine. Well, they were able to identify him from those purchases. They arrest his ass in the Ukraine, promptly throw him in jail, start the extraditing procedures, all right? He stays in the Ukrainian jail for six weeks. Politician comes out and says, oh, he's a good guy. They let him out. He goes on to hire the most expensive attorneys on the planet. I don't know how many he hired, but they were the best. He fights extradition. He beats extradition. 
during the extradition proceedings. Visa is there, MasterCard, every law enforcement agency on the planet is there in the courtroom. This kid, script, Dmitry Golubov, he's turning around during the proceedings, laughing, smiling, and waving at Visa, MasterCard, Secret Service, everybody else. He beats extradition. What does he do then? He goes on to start his own political party called the Internet Party of the Ukraine. And because he has a sense of humor, it's platform to stomp out fraud. <laughs> this is this kid. Their first, their first candidate as mayor of Kiev, they ran Darth Vader. You can look it up online. Darth Vader was the first candidate of the Internet Party of the Ukraine. Now, of course, Darth didn't win that. But in Kiev today, in the town square, there's this big statue of Darth Vader there that just to commemorate him running as mayor. So today, Dmitry is on parliament in the Ukraine. He stands a chance of being one of the presidents of the Ukraine. Now, does he admit to being script? Oh, no. No, 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 no. I've actually, uh, I've actually given a couple of interviews that has talked about Dmitry. They've tried to reach out to Dmitry. These interviewers have written a couple of books, and Dmitry won't even talk to him. I am not that guy, is what he says. But by God, he is that guy. He's the guy who started Carter Planet. He's the guy who stole all this money that ripped all these people off, everything else. That's Dmitry. That's why Dmitry today can't step out of the country of the Ukraine, because as soon as he does, his ass is going to get 20 to 40 years. So that's Dmitry. Uh, who else was there? I mean, I don't know. You know what? There was David Appleyard. He was like my third or fourth in charge. Now, I haven't heard you mention him. Uh, unless, what's his screen name? So he went by the screen name of Black Ops, is who he went by. He was into um, just education. He wanted counterfeit degrees. So he was the head of the counterfeit degree forums that we had on Counterfeit Library and uh, Shadow Crew. All right? The big thing about David, he was from Linwood, Linwood New Jersey a retired mortgage broker. He's in his 60s now. <laughs> all right. Then he gave up brokering mortgages because he had a taste for that illicit side of life. He stops being a legitimate person and goes into cybercrime and gets five years is what this dude gets. I looked him up. Actually, I looked him up last night. He was arrested back, I think, 2011, 2012 again for not paying child support or... or wife support or whatever the hell that stuff is. He wasn't paying it, so they picked his ass up again. So I guess things have went south for the dude, as they rightfully should have. Which brings us finally, we should always mention this cat, Daniel Rigmaiden. Man, I'm, I'm going to tell you, if he ever listens to this, probably get sued. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel Rigmaiden, he was, when I started working for the Secret Service, and I'm lumping all these guys in together, just the Shadow Crew guys, because he was on Shadow Crew, but it, he doesn't get arrested for several years after that. So what happens is, when I was working with Secret Service, Daniel Rigmaiden reaches out to me, because I was the guy that was doing all this tax fraud, tax return identity theft. I'm the guy who started that, right? So Daniel's wanting to make money, and we ended up setting him up. Uh, he wanted to find out how to do tax fraud, and we had all these prepaid debit cards, so we're like, we'll send you some debit cards. <laughs> so he was an idiot, and he decided, oh yeah, send me debit cards. So we sent him like 30 debit cards, recorded his address, identified him almost immediately, everything else. So he starts engaging in tax fraud, you know, tax return identity theft. They catch him. I went to prison in 2007. Jeez, I think they arrested him two or three years after that, because what the feds tend to do is they'll let the case build. Hey, as long as you're going to hang yourself, you go right ahead, dude. You know, build that dollar amount up. That way you get some good time out of this. So he was living in a shack, <laughs> operating, using one of these mobile hotspots, and they used a Stingray device to catch him. So a Stingray is a cell phone spoofer, a tower spoofer. All right, it can identify uh, where you are, you know, it does geolocation. It can spot you within seven feet of where you actually are. It can uh, intercept text messages. It can spoof an, an entire tower as well. So anything a tower can do, it can do as well. Everything else. So they use the Stingray device. Now, Stingray is an extremely secret 
device. I mean, it is. Not How secret? Now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How secret is it? So back then, and this is not that many years ago, back then, feds simply would not mention it. They would hide its use completely. All right, And that's legal to do that. All right? they, if it's a sophisticated means that aids an investigation, it's legal for the feds to cover that up so that it's not disclosed how that investigation started. Okay, It's legal for that. Stingray is so important, even today it's so important, that sometimes they'll drop the case. So what Daniel does is he has no idea how they found, found him. He's, he's literally in a fucking shack using a hot spot filing these taxes when they arrest his ass. They promptly bring him to Columbia, South Carolina, throw him in the county jail there. This kid spends not a year in the county jail. This kid spends several years in the county jail. He fires his lawyers. He decides to represent himself. And he does an outstanding job. So outstanding, this kid files hundreds and thousands of FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests. He gets, they actually give the kid a laptop in the county jail so he can defend himself with internet access. They give him the ability, he, he's able to hire private investigators. One of the private investigators comes to see yours truly. I was living in Panama City at that point. He flies down to see me. What can you tell me about Daniel Rigmaiden? And my answer was, well, he's a fucking idiot for one thing. And they were like, well, look, he's defended himself. He's got all this stuff going on. Looks like he's going to get out of it. I'm like, what? Looks like he's going to get out of it. Because what come to find out, what happens is he files so many freedom of information requests that one of the requests comes back and it mentions something about a cell phone tower spoofer. So anyone that with any technical knowledge whatsoever, they read that and they're like, that sounds a lot like Stingray. So Daniel sees that and goes apeshit. Is that even legal for them to do that is what he's questioning. Well, the feds don't want to argue that because come to find out, it may not be legal. Right. So they want to try to hide that. All right. So the prosecutor, prosecutor says, I'll tell you what, you plead guilty, we'll call it time served and let you out. Daniel's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, you just plead guilty. We won't mention this stuff anymore. Time served. Boot you out now. Daniel pleads guilty. Now, Daniel ends up serving. It's like five years total in this county jail that Daniel ends up serving. So he's a convicted felon. Now, there was an American Greed show on this kid. I call him a kid. He's an adult. There was an American Greed show on him. There have been several articles written about him everything else. What does he do? Because he has not accepted responsibility at all. What does he do? He sues NBC. Why? They called me a hacker. I'm not a hacker. I'm a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hack anything. There's no hacking going on. No shit. This is this kid's lawsuit that he files. I didn't hack anything. I just stole money. And I want, not only that, but I want that show to go away which is one of the things that you would ask about my associates. Daniel's done this. A couple of other guys have done this as well, trying to, to cover up their criminal activity. They're convicted felons, and they're trying to hide from what they've done. And I'll tell you, there's no hiding from it. You've got Google these days. You can find anybody. You can find out whatever you want to about anybody. You're not going to hide from that. But Daniel has been adamant about trying to hide from that. At the same time, he's, he's kind of developed this cult following about being a privacy advocate. Because, oh, they use Stingray against me. Well, yeah, they use Stingray against you. You're a friggin' criminal, man. <laughs> of course they're going to find you. And you know what? I support that 100%. I think you should have got 10 or 15 years behind bars, personally. But they let you out of it. So be happy they let you out of it. You're not a privacy advocate. You're a fucking criminal. That's all you are. I had another guy, that another one of my associates. What he has done is... <laughs> I forgot the kid's name. But he's trying to exercise the right to be forgotten. Ah. All right? Yeah. So in the, U, in the EU and the UK, you can tell Google to remove you. And they have to. All right? So this kid is not in the UK. He's not in the EU. He's in Dallas, Texas. But 
what he's tried to do, and he's done this several times, is he finds somebody overseas with the same name. And he says, that's me. Remove that information. And it works for about a week or two until they realize, you're not overseas. You're this idiot down here in Dallas. We're putting it right back up there. But that's, that's, that's one of the big... You ask about the associates. Kevlar, I think, accepted responsibility. A few of the other guys that I've talked to, they've accepted responsibility too. But most of them, no. Most of them are the same mindset that they were when they were committing crime. And I think that most of them are probably back doing the exact same thing they did when I was involved. It's, it's, it's that whole thing I mentioned before. Unless something makes you change, you're not going to. All right, so that was episode number 77 of the Brett Johnson Show, A Rogues Gallery. I hope you all enjoyed listening to it. Look, hey, look, if you enjoy the show, please take the time out to subscribe. I don't care if you subscribe to Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, what have you. I just need the subscribers because, hey, I'm trying to make sure that this show starts making some money. Needless to say, I've mentioned that we are undergoing some changes, and we absolutely are. I'm going to be interviewing uh, security folks and law enforcement, some former criminals as well, as part of the Brett Johnson Show. We're going to try to, um, either it will remain on the Brett Johnson Show, or it'll spout off into different little sub-shows. I'm, I'm, right now, I don't know how that's going to work. I'm not sure if I'm going to have a separate prison politics show, or if I'm just going to incorporate prison politics and talking to former felons as part of the Brett Johnson Show. We'll see how it goes, how it feels what the response is of the audience. So please subscribe. Whether you like it or not, please subscribe. I need the numbers. Let me know what you think. Let me hear your feedback. I read every single comment, and I usually comment on those comments. So what do we do? We're ending the show. We end it the same way every day. Stay safe. Stay secure. Stay vigilant. More importantly, understand that this is the Brett Johnson Show. At the end of the day, just do the right damn thing. I'm Brett Johnson. Thank you for listening. Until next time.